During the dread reign of cholera in New York, I had accepted the invitation of a relative to spend a fortnight with him here in the retirement of his cottage on the banks of the Hudson. We should have passed the time pleasantly enough, but for the fearful news which reached us every morning from the populous city, not a day elapsed which did not bring us intelligence of the decease of some acquaintance. We trembled at the approach of every messenger. The very air from the city seemed to us redolent with death. I could neither speak, think, nor dream of anything else. My host was of a less excitable temperament. To the realities of terror, he was sufficiently alive, but of its shadows, he had no apprehension. I was not so fortunate, and the palsying fears of evil and death had taken possession of my soul. My state of mind had been well primed for the terrifying incident which soon took place. Near the close of an exceedingly warm day, I was alone, sitting with a book in hand at this window, commanding through a long vista of the river banks a view of a distant hill, the face of which nearest my position had been denuded by a landslide of the principal portion of its trees. My thoughts had been long wandering from the volume before me to the gloom and desolation of the neighboring city. Uplifting my eyes from the page, they fell upon the naked face of the hill and upon an object, upon some living monster of hideous conformation, which very rapidly made its way from the summit to the bottom, disappearing finally in the dense forest below. As this creature first came in sight, I, I doubted my own sanity, and many minutes passed before I, I succeeded in convincing myself that I was neither mad nor in a dream. Estimating the size of the creature, I concluded it to be far larger than any ship of the line in existence. I say ship of the line because the shape of the monster suggested the idea the hull of one of our battleships might convey a very tolerable conception of the general outline. The mouth of the animal was situated at the end of a tube some 60 or 70 feet in length and about as thick as the body of an ordinary elephant. Near the root of this trunk was an immense quantity of black shaggy hair, more than could have been supplied by the coats of a score of buffalo, and projecting from this hair downwardly and laterally sprang two gleaming tusks, not unlike that of the wild boar but of infinitely greater dimension. The body was fashioned like a wedge with a point toward the earth. From it, there were outspread two pairs of wings, each wing nearly 100 yards in length, one pair being placed above the other and all thickly covered with metal scales, each scale apparently some 10 or 12 feet in diameter. But the chief peculiarity of this horrible thing was the representation of a death's head, which covered nearly the whole surface of its breast, and which was as accurately traced in glaring white upon the dark ground of the body as if it had been carefully designed by an artist. While I regarded this terrifying animal, and more especially the appearance on its breast, with a feeling of horror and awe, I perceived the huge jaws at the extremity of the trunk suddenly expand themselves, and from them there proceeded a sound so loud and so expressive of woe that it struck upon my nerves like a knell. And as the monster disappeared at the foot of the hill, I fell almost fainting to the floor. Upon recovering, my first impulse was to inform my friend of what I had seen and heard, and I can scarcely explain what feeling of repugnance it was which in the end operated to prevent me. At length, one evening, some three or four days after the occurrence, we were sitting together in this room in which I had seen the apparition, I occupying the same seat at the same window and he lounging in this chair nearby. The association of the place and time suddenly impelled me to give him an account of the phenomenon. He heard me to the end. At first, he laughed heartily, 
And then he lapsed into an excessively grave demeanor, as if my insanity was a thing beyond suspicion. At this instant, I again had a distinct view of the monster, to which, with a shout of absolute terror, I now directed his attention. Look! Look! He looked eagerly, but maintained that he saw nothing, although I designated minutely the course of the creature as it made its way down the naked face of the hill. I was now immeasurably alarmed, for I considered the vision either as an omen of my death or worse, as a forerunner of an attack of madness. I threw myself passionately back in the, in the window seat, and, and for some moments I buried my face in my hands. My host, however, had in some degree resumed the calmness of his demeanor and questioned me very rigorously in respect to the confirmation of the visionary creature. When I had fully satisfied him on this head, he sighed deeply as if relieved of some intolerable burden, and then he stepped to the bookcase and brought forth one of the ordinary synopsis of natural history. He then requested me to exchange seats with him. He took my place at the window and, opening the book, resumed his discourse. But for your minuteness, he said, in describing the monster, I might never have had it in my power to demonstrate to you what it was. In the first place, let me read to you a schoolboy account of the genus Sphinx of the family Crepuscularia of the class of Insecta or Insects. The account runs thus. Four membranous wings covered with little colored scales of metallic appearance, mouth forming a roll tube produced by an elongation of the jaws, upon the sides of which are found the rudiments of mandibles and downy palpi, abdomen pointed, the death-headed, the death-headed sphinx has occasioned much terror among the unlearned by the melancholy kind of cry which it utters, and the insignia of death which it wears upon its corslet. He closed the book and leaned back in the seat, placing himself accurately in the position which I had occupied at the moment of beholding the monster. Ah, there it is, he exclaimed. It is reascending the face of the hill and a very remarkable creature I admit it to be. Still, it is by no means so large or so distant as you had imagined it. For the fact is that as it wriggles its way up this thread which some spider has wrought along the window sash, I find it to be about the sixteenth of an inch in its extreme length and also about the sixteenth of an inch distance from the pupil of my eye. Thank <laughs> you.